Hello everybody and welcome to the first lesson in a new series on land law. In this lesson what we're going to essentially be doing is talking about some of the introductory principles pertaining to land and the ownership of land as well as the various distinctions between different kinds of rights that exist in terms of and in relation to land and then we will outline the scope of this series at the end. This is the first lesson in the subject of land law. Like I've said, we are talking about some basic introductory issues which pertain to and relate to the nature of land, the nature of land ownership and the nature of rights uh, to land. All of which, of course, are very important for the study of land law. And we'll also outline the basic structure uh, of the series, which is going to be essentially the subject of the uh, of lessons in the next few weeks and months. So ordinarily, when we talk about law in relation to land, we can either define this as land law, as the name might suggest, but some textbooks and or university modules may describe this as a series of lessons on, quote, property law. And that's because in some circumstances, you might uh, essentially use the word land and the word property interchangeably. So, for example, if you get a mortgage, you'll be getting a mortgage on a property uh, and you're referring to a, a house or a flat, for example. And so as a result of which, we tend to sort of mix those two phrases together such that you may be studying property law and essentially doing the exact same thing as studying land law. I use land law uh, as, a, as a title owing to the fact that it seems to be the case that a lot of um, textbooks, most textbooks tend to use the, the phrase land law, but also because land law relates to more than just the law that, that talks about property, that talks about ownership of, of a house or a flat or, or, or business premises, for example. It also talks about specific other kinds of rights that exist over land. So in this way, essentially, the it's it is uh, in in a way this is correct given the fact that lessons on this subject are lessons about property in a way, uh, ownership of property, the transfer of property, and rights to enjoy said property. However, the fact that exists here is that we make a delineation between the kind of property that is purchased in reference to land law, i.e. land as a special kind of property, um, sometimes known as real property or realty, and the other kinds of property that may exist. So, for example, your phone or, or, or a table, that is being um, something known as personal property, for example. And so the property in this sense that we're talking about is um, actually land. We're talking about land itself. And the latter of these also gives rise to something known as, or at least within land law, we have uh, rise, uh, give rise to the idea of proprietary rights. And so land law and the study of proprietary rights is the study of rights in land specifically. So... While rights in land may also be personal rights, uh, we will get to that in future lessons time, the distinction between rights which are proprietary and rights which are personal is actually an integral part of the study of land law. In fact, if you're given a problem question uh, and you're asked to essentially talk about the purchase of, of, of land, purchase of property, and you're asked to talk about and identify the various third party interests in uh, a, p a particular piece of land, you might have to begin by talking about whether or not the interest in question uh, that is a third party interest is a proprietary right or a personal right. And in doing so, that will essentially change quite significantly the direction of your response to a problem question. So the ability to identify a proprietary right essentially allows uh, the owner of that right to enforce action against both the previous owner of the right and also in certain circumstances to against third parties. And so proprietary rights are considered to be very, very important when we talk about um, when we talk about land law specifically. They are seen as rights in the land itself sometimes described as the right in REM. That's what we're going to use um, in this uh, series of lessons. We'll talk about the concept of rights in REM as opposed to rights in persona, per, uh, personal rights. And so ultimately, one of the things that is quite uh, interesting in terms of um, 
in terms of the way in which we study land law in relation to the jurisdiction of England and Wales is talking about the concept of ownership and land ownership. Does it make sense to suggest that you own land? This is the first question. When you buy a property, do you own the land? Let's say you win the lottery, okay, and you don't have to have any kind of mortgage, you don't have to have any kind of issue related to that. You get given two million pounds and you go and you buy a house outright with cash, let's say. Um, <laughs> When you do that, do you own the land itself? Do you Are you the, the rightful and sole owner of that property, of the land in which that property is built on? The, the answer to that question is actually no. Uh, the technical answer is no. Um, we'll get into the reason why in future lessons when we look at the sort of historical develop of land ownership um, in relation to this subject. But for now, let's just talk a little bit about um, the actual ownership of land and something known as the idea of an estate in land. So in England and Wales, land ownership is technically the remit of the crown. Only the crown can own land and therefore all the property that you buy is not actually um, the, the transfer of ownership from a previous owner to you or even the transfer of ownership from the crown to you, for example. That's not how it works. In reality, individual persons do not have legal ownership to land per se considering the fact that they own what are known as estates in land. There are, you own estates in land, you don't own the land itself, technically. Now, in reality, this is one of those little technical uh, things that uh, is a quite an idiosyncratic uh, example of why, uh, of why England and Wales is quite complicated in terms of how legal structuring works in this particular jurisdiction. Um, but ultimately, uh, in reality, if you are somebody who owns a particular estate in the land in question, we'll get to that in a second, then you are, for all intents and purposes, the true owners of the land. Um, King Charles isn't going to come along and kick you out of your property even though uh, land ownership is technically the remit of the crown. Now, when it comes to estates in land, we mainly divide these up into two distinct categories. You have what is known as the freehold estate, and you have what is known as the leasehold estate. Now, Ultimately, when we talk about um, each of these things, we're going to talk about them individually in, in more detail in, in future lessons time. Uh, but essentially, the distinction that is made here is that with the freehold, you are, for all intents and purposes, the owner of the property in the same way that um, you own any other kind of property. Um, even though technically, like I've said, it is the remit of the crown, you are, for all intents and purposes, the owner of the freehold estate. A leasehold estate gives you what is known as a slice of time. So it gives you essentially the rights of a freehold owner, but for a limited period. And we'll get to the um, the sort of Street and Malford requirements and characteristics of leasehold estates and the lease itself um, and see what actually uh, it takes for a lease to be formed uh, and what delineates a lease from the freehold and what delineates a lease from a license or a lease from an easement for example all of these different things we'll get to in future lessons time and speaking of which, let's talk about the scope of this series of lessons. We'll begin by talking about just a general introduction to land law. Uh, this is going to be looking at some introductory remarks. We're going to be looking at, for example, the history of la land ownership, the way land and the view of land uh, throughout the history of, of England and Wales, talking about the concept of feudal rights, talking about the way in which this develops into the modern system of land registration, for example, uh, the Law of Property Act 1925, etc, etc, etc. We will then also talk about, at the beginning of this series of lessons, the delineation that can be made between legal and equitable rights in land. Now, ultimately, um, one of the things that is often quite difficult for, for some law students to, to get their heads around is this distinction between legal rights and equitable rights. And this is often not uh, helped by the fact that if you study land law before you study equity and trusts, for example, or vice versa, uh, then you're going to uh, essentially um, be hampered in one way or another, depending on your, your in-depth understanding of, of equity and equitable rights. Um, but we will cover uh, briefly the distinction between legal and equitable rights in land in the first few lessons and essentially what we will do is whenever this comes back up um, so for example when we look at co-ownership and when we look at trusts of land we will see that there is um, a distinction that is made between legal and equitable rights there it is also made in various other circumstances as well
We will then move on to looking at the actual substantive detail of this course. We'll talk firstly about the registered title system, the concept of registered land, the registration of land and the land registry, the, 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 the process by which land is registered, and also talking about interests which are protected by the land register uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to the, the the fundamental characteristics of the land registry and the importance of it. This will mean engaging with uh, several pieces of legislation, talking about, for example, the the Law of Property Act as well as the 2002 Land Registration Act. We will then move on to talking about the unregistered title system. Uh, unregistered title system is uh, an increasingly um, shrinking area of the law, given the fact that essentially the long and short of this particular topic is that um, where a conveyance or where the purchase of or, or, or the a disposition of unregistered title takes place, um, this um, automatically then becomes registered land as we as we have more and more land being entered into the land registry. So the idea of unregistered title and the amount of unregistered title that exists in England and Wales is shrinking um, for as much as <laughs> increasingly so. We'll talk about the ownership of unregistered title, the transfer of unregistered title, as well as legal and equitable property rights within the unregistered title system. We'll look at land charges, the Land Charges Act, the registration of land charges, and then we'll move on to our next topic, the next topic being trusts of land, okay? Again, this is all very important and should really be done in conjunction with your uh, subject studies on equity and trusts, uh, in my opinion at least. And so we will talk about the concept of the trust. Uh, we'll do a little brief introduction of the concept of a trust uh, in this lesson, despite the fact that we are also doing lessons on equity and trusts alongside these. And then we will also talk about the appointment of trustees, including their removal uh, and or their retirement, and then also the power that trustees have, uh, have over land in uh, benefit for a particular beneficiary. We will then in section five, uh, topic five, should I say, start to talk about co-ownership of land, uh, the nature of co-ownership, the distinction between legal and equitable rights in relation to co-ownership. If you notice, we are talking quite a lot about law and equity and the distinction between the two, hence why it's important to have that introductory topic at the beginning. Um, also, the doctrine of severance for joint tenants oopsie -daisy, and the uh, methods of severance, the ways in which severance can actually be achieved. Uh, we will then talk about disputes which involve co-owners, the resolution of those disputes, and then also the concept of co-ownership in relation to registered title. Session six is going to look at licenses. We'll talk about what a license is, the types of licenses that exist, including estoppel licenses, and then the doctrine of proprietary estoppel specifically. Section seven, we'll talk about the leasehold, the concept of leases. This includes the nature of the lease, including definitions. The most pertinent definition, of course, being from the case of Street and Mountford. The types of leases that exist, as well as the termination of a lease. Um, the termination of a lease being done through a number of different methods. The most substantive that we're going to be talking about is, of course, the method of forfeiture. Section 8 will talk about the concept of adverse possession. We'll take an introduction to the concept and rationale relating to the idea of adverse possession. We will then talk about possession and the effect of adverse possession in more detail. Before moving on in section 9 to looking at easements, uh, the concept of the easement, uh, the characteristics of the easement, the definition of the easement as laid down in the case of Riel and Park, uh, as well as the basic requirements for the existence of an easement, including the creation of express and implied grants of easements and the enforcement of easements and then finishing off easements by talking about rules of prescription section 10 we'll look at covenants the idea of a freehold covenant a restrictive and positive covenants and then we're going to finish off in the end on section 11 which covers the subject of mortgages what a mortgage is the creation of a mortgage as well as the operation of mortgages in the real world what I want to do in this lesson is talk about the history of land ownership within the processes of England and Wales and the legal system that is of England and Wales. And the reason why this is the case is because in the previous lesson in our introduction to land law, what we did was introduce the subject as well as look at some of the unique features of land ownership. And 
one of the specific features that we're going to focus quite a lot of our time on today is this idea that land is not owned by individual people. Land is owned by the crown. It is owned by the monarchy. And in fact, the only kind of interest that you can have in land is either an interest itself or an estate. Now, this is a very interesting and unique uh, feature of, of land ownership in England and Wales. And so some of these unique features, specifically that unique feature that I've just mentioned, is uh, is a result of and comes out of the fact that the history of land ownership in England and Wales is particularly long and particularly complicated. And so as a result of this, we have the settlement of, of, of land law as we know it today because of this historical development. And so that's what this subject, that's what this lesson is going to be about, the subject of this lesson. We're going to examine the history of land ownership in England and Wales and see how some of these developments have led to the system that we know of today, the system of having estates and interests in land. So we established in the previous lesson that land law is a subset of property law. We've noted this already. It's a type, a very, very special type of property that exists. It's not personal property in the sense of some kind of um, personal good. It is not intellectual property in, to, in, the, idea, in, in the sense of some kind of um, intellectual idea. It is a type of property which is sometimes described as realty or real property. Now, in reality, the history of land law informs the concepts that we can still accept today, um, or at least forms some of the broader overarching themes and, uh, and examinations that we can look at today, rather than necessarily every single concept that we have today. Uh, it informs a lot of some of the most fundamental and foundational principles that we have today. So let's spend some time talking about the various histories and the historical development of land law in England and Wales. Now, the first thing I want to note is the thing that we started this lesson with and the thing that we ended the previous lesson with, which is this idea that we do not own land. We own estates and interests. And by we, I mean the people, unless you are the monarch that is watching this video. Um, we're ta I'm talking about individual people. So historically, land was seen as a gift from God. And this is the important element that we have to think about here, because essentially, uh, just like with lots of other area of law, especially in the very early periods of medieval England, uh, the development of England, the establishment of the Anglo-Saxon period, uh, as well as the development within the Norman conquest and the uh, Angevin Empire, for example, all of these things were very much steeped in the ideas of the natural law and the ideas of religion and and specifically uh, catholicism within within and christianity within england and so land was seen as some kind of gift from god and this theological interpretation of land informs the nature of land ownership and it also informs why it is the case that the monarchy owns land and that we only own estates and interests in said land because land is seen as a gift from god and given the fact that uh, the crown of england the person who sits on the crown the person who sits on the throne in england uh, is considered to have what is known as the divine right of kings um this theological interpretation which develops around the 1200s um slightly before um gives this um, essentially allows for the development of the view and the idea that the crown owns land because land is a gift from god rather than the people now with the development of this understanding of land and the role slash relationship that land has with the crown we see a shift away from the traditional understanding of the crown in England to the more modern interpretation of the crown in England, or at least a, a newer development in the crown in England, because the monarch went from being the king of the English, the king of the people, to the king of England, in England, the land itself. So less about the subjects who occupy the land and more the king of the land itself. This is how that shift essentially leads to the very slow and gradual development of the monarchy being the owner of land in England and Wales and the only uh, estates and interests can be owned by all the ordinary folk <laughs> who want to purchase land.
And so as such, around the 1200s, a little bit before, the concept of land was something that has always had belonged to the crown. Another major development which takes place during this period is this idea of feudalism. And feudalism is incredibly important for our understanding of the development of land law because following the Norman conquests of England, uh, um, uh, uh, the system of feudalism would begin to develop. Of course, uh, the Norman conquest of, uh, of England takes place in 1066. And then from there, we see uh, what is essentially the roots of the modern monarchal uh, dynasty that we have today, or at least the monarchal reign, the, the, the line of succession that can go all, be traced all the way back to the Norman conquest. So a system of feudalism begins to develop after the Norman conquest, and we can understand why feudalism developed uh, in and of itself, uh, firstly for a number of reasons, but we can also understand why feudalism is important for our understanding of land law development for a number of reasons as well. Because as already established, one of the things that was developing alongside the development of feudalism is this view that the crown becomes the sole owner of land within England and Wales. And then secondly, um, one of the things that is important from an economic perspective why feudalism begins to uh, become embedded within the English system is that labour is an inefficient task during the Norman conquest and for the vast majority of English history owing to a lack of industrialization as well as a lack of coordination at the time. Of course the industrial revolution won't take place until the 1800s um, and so as a result of this uh, we see uh, feudalism begin to take shape and so feudalism being this um, idea that begins to take place um, essentially comes about when the king allows people to use and occupy the land um, in return for the performance of particular services. And this um, becomes known as the doctrine of tenure, essentially. And so what is interesting is that no actual transfer of land ever takes place. Instead, the service would be performed in return for the crown to allow the enjoyment of that land um, for the individual who is performing said service for the crown. This is known as tenure. Now, this relationship between the individual who is performing a service in return for the enjoyment of land and the monarch who is allowing the enjoyment of land in return for the benefits of that service is not something that is a relationship which is limited to just that of the person in question and the monarchy. That person in question can then also um, offer a tenure to somebody else. The person who has received tenure can offer tenure to some other individual by which they allow them to uh, use their land and enjoy their land in return for particular services. This process of offering tenure and, and increasingly essentially dividing up land in return for services is something known as subimputation. And so a result of this is that a, a, a quite vast and complex system of feudalism begins to develop and to take place. Now, skipping over to land ownership today, we know that land is still owned by the crown in modern England and Wales, uh, in the modern legal system of England and Wales, and so one should view one's relationship with land as either one of an estate in land or an interest in land. Unless you are the monarch, unless you're King Charles watching this right now, um, that is how you should view and understand the nature of land ownership in this country. And so ultimately, with all this being said, we're going to start to move on soon to looking at the specific estates that exist in land. We're going to start with, uh, I believe, registered title or maybe unregistered title. And um, we're going to that focuses specifically on the nature of the freehold estate. And um, we know from the previous lesson that there are broadly two kinds of estates in land, that of the freehold and that of the leasehold. We'll be focusing firstly on the freehold estate for, for the majority of the first set of lessons, talking, like I said, about registered versus unregistered title systems. And then we will start to look at leases and the leasehold estate before we move on to looking at some of the more subsidiary issues, such as trusts in land, mortgage easements and covenants. Over the last couple of lessons we've been talking about the nature of land law. We've been taking some introductory matters in the subject of land law. We've talked about for example the history of land ownership in a little bit more detail and how this history has essentially solidified into the system of land law and the structure of land ownership that we have today. But at no point in this uh, series of lessons have we actually defined what it means to call something land and actually define what land is. Uh, so 
that's what we're going to do in this lesson and also what we're going to do in the next lesson because essentially what we're going to do in this lesson is define the subject of land law so we're going to be talking about the subject of land law being of course the issue of land the idea of what land actually is how we can define it where does land begin and end in terms of ownership and then in the next lesson we're going to look at the we're going to shift away from the subject of land law to the subject of land law specifically so to, the, so shifting away from the subject of land to the idea of land law i.e what does land law particularly study this involves an examination of the different kinds of property which can exist and the way in which we make these delineations which we can therefore clearly delimit the the topics within land law that we know of um, things like for example freehold estates leases trusts of land co-ownership etc 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 so let's think about this question what actually is land and given that this is a series of lessons on land law, it's probably important that we find some kind of concrete definition to what land actually is, i.e. what the subject of this series of lessons is, what we are actually going to be examining in this series of lessons. Now, luckily for us, land law is a subject which is often quite heavily influenced by legislation. So you're going to become very familiar with, for example, the Law of Property Act. And so as a result of this, we have a lots of different different um, provisions which give us definitions of various different things. These include, of course, a definition of what constitutes land. And if we go to general definitions within the Law of Property Act of 1925, um, we find ourselves in section 205 of the legislation. This is where we have uh, general definitions, okay? And it says in this legislation that in this act, unless the context otherwise requires, the following expressions have the meanings hereby assigned to them respectively. That is to say, uh, and then it starts to define a number of different things. We scroll all the way down to, um, to part IX we will find the definition of land. And it says here the following. It says that land includes land of any tenure and mines and minerals, whether or not held apart from the surface, buildings or part of buildings, whether the division is horizontal or uh, vertical or made in any other way, and other corporeal hereditaments, <laughs> hereditaments, uh, also a, a manor uh, and, 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 and ad vousum and a rent or other uh, and other incorporeal uh, hereditaments and an easement right privilege or benefit in over or derived from the land so um particularly difficult to read uh, as you've just seen with me trying to read some of these some of these uh, words things like hereditaments uh, is quite a, a difficult i don't even know if i'm pronouncing that correctly uh, either um and one of the things that should be noted is that this is legislation that was passed in 1925 and though so therefore a lot of the the phraseology in this particular uh, provision is quite outdated okay so we don't need to know for example this precise definition of an advowson for example or or even a manner in the same kind of way uh, because this is uh, outdated language um compared to uh hereditaments um which are um we're gonna get to in a second which uh, which essentially define a, a physical or a non-tangible interest in land so the question is, is this a particularly useful definition of land? It is particularly uh, overarching and all-encompassing in terms of what actually constitute land. So it includes things like, for example, um, things that are part or held apart from the surface of land, um, buildings or part of buildings. It can talk about the horizontal division or the vertical division. Uh, and then it talks about um, the different kinds of interest in lands. So something like a, a, a physical interest in land or something like a an intangible uh, interest in land or even an interest in land which exists in the sense of an easement, for example. So... Um, in some cases, we can see that it has some use. So, for example, it does define the rights over land. So it defines, for example, easements. And we're going to get to easements in a later lesson when we look at um, look at the, the various different interests that exist within, uh, within land, or specifically legal interests. Um, but in other contexts, we have examples of language that are particularly difficult to unpack. Um, so I have defined here what a corporeal uh, hereditament is. Um, and it is a, a property right which is capable of being passed down through inheritance. 
that is what a hereditament is and the corporeal uh, element refers to the fact that it is tangible and it is um, therefore physical uh, and then obviously if we then take the inverse of this we will find that um, an incorporeal hereditament uh, is a uh, is a property which has the right to be a property right which can be inherited uh, but it is uh, in not tangible it is intangible it is in incorporeal uh, and so as a result of this we can have examples such as a rent charge or an easement okay so these are the definitions of, of land um, these are the kinds of things that we can think about now in terms of the importance of coming up with a definition of land, it's not necessarily too important um, for, for your subjects and for your studies, but I think it's necessary just to, to go through the definition of land in this lesson as a general way of uh, giving you an indication of not only what land is in and of itself, but what kind of interests also exist over land as well. And then I want to finish finally by talking about the, the limits of land ownership. So the two major limits that we can think about is in relation to the vertical extension of ownership of a particular piece of land, i.e. how far above the land itself do does a person have a right to, and so also how far below does a person have a right to. So essentially, how high can you go to claim and still claim property rights over a piece of land? If I had a piece of land that I owned right now, and if I went into a hot air balloon and just went straight up, how high would I go before I leave the jurisdictional boundary of my property rights and enter into, for example, um, national airspace and then into actual outer space? And the same way is how low can I go? If I have a piece of land and I, and I decide to start digging, how far down can I go uh, before I leave the jurisdictional um, area of my property rights over that particular piece of land? Uh, will I lose uh, property uh, rights before I reach the centre of the earth, for example? Um, well, you may think that these are relatively meaningless questions. Why does it matter if you own a house, how high um, that ownership extends? Um, but one example is if what if you were to find some valuable material under your property? Uh, do you have ownership rights of those uh, of those materials? At that point, if you find gold or you find some kind of uh, treasure at the bot underneath your property, then you will be very much interested in whether or not uh, your 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 right to a particular piece of land extends below the ground because at that point you may have claims and ownership rights to that particular piece of property and you might be rich so obviously these are things that are important to ask and ascertain the general rule has historically been examined through the enshrinement of a particularly interesting Latin maxim. I'm not going to try and pronounce the Latin maxim, given my uh, given my struggles even pronouncing some of the English words within the Law of Property Act, but it essentially translates roughly to the idea that the landowner owns everything up to the heavens and everything down to hell below. The idea being that there is no limitation, theoretically, on the ownership of a particular piece of land when we talk about the vertical extension of that ownership. You can go all the way up to the heavens and you can go all the way down to hell. Obviously, um, given the fact that uh, we can't define where heaven and hell actually are, uh, as terms of, or at least in terms of a legal uh, question and the, the procedural elements, um, this isn't particularly helpful. So we have to really think about the practicalities of this rule and apply it differently. And that's what the case law has done. In 1978, we have the case of Bernstein and Skyviews and General Limited. And essentially, the fundamental element of this uh, was the question that the court was asked to determine, which is the potential upper limit to land ownership. So how high can we go and still say that we own this particular part of the property? And the courts concluded that ownership will extend to such a height as is necessary for the ordinary use and enjoyment of the land and the structures upon it. This is quite interesting because what this is doing is not setting a distinct objective limit to where land ownership ends. It's not saying that land ownership exists for a mile above any piece of land and that is it. It is saying that it is subjective. It depends as it depends on how high as would be necessary for an ordinary use and enjoyment of the land as well as the structures upon it. 
So given the fact that we are talking about the particular interest in the land itself, it depends. If you own a two bedroom house, you'll probably not need as much vertical space to enjoy the land as if you, for example, were the owner of a skyscraper. And so as a result of which, it doesn't make much sense to have an objective single limit. It depends on the particular property in question, and it depends on your ordinary use and enjoyment of that land. Alternatively, in 2011, the question of where, how far below the ground you can go and still have ownership rights was asked in the case of Bacardo SA and Star Energy UK Onshore Limited. Um, this case looked at the opposite, like I've just said, and essentially the extent to which the ownership of land extends below the surface. The essential question here for the Supreme Court wasn't necessarily trying to look at coming up with a, a specific definition of how far below the earth the, the, the ownership of land extends, but rather it asks the question of will you apply the same standard as you applied in the case of Bernstein uh, to the uh, opposite end of the spectrum, to going under the ground. So is the same principle uh, of the necessitary, necessity of the height for the ordinary use and enjoyment of the land um, similar in the sense of going down as it is as going up? And Instead of um, actually adopting this approach in Bernstein, the courts said the following. They say that the owner, the landowner uh, of a particular piece of property is the owner of the strata beneath it, including the materials that are to be found there, unless there has been an alienation of them by a conveyance, a common law or by statute to somebody else. So this is essentially the conclusion to this question. The conclusion is, um, and in fact, we are not going to apply the same rule as we did in the case of Bernstein. We're actually going to say that it is the owner of the substrata beneath it. And this seems to make a little bit more sense, given the fact that you can go higher than you can go lower when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, the property rights of, of land. You're not going to be going too much um, under the ground, but there is the potential to go all the way up into the air when you're talking about the, the vertical extension of land ownership. So um, the adoption of this new rule for, for going under the ground um, seems to apply and make uh, sense, and it seems to make sense to not apply the same principle as existed in the case of Bernstein.